Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, and we praise Thee for the privilege and the opportunity of fellowshipping together in Your Word. We commit the, the hour here to You, asking that the Holy Spirit might strip away that which is foolish and that which is carnal, but would seal to our hearts that which is truth, that we might grow together in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. For it's in His name we pray. Amen. In our Sunday series here, we're going through 2 Corinthians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had reached the end of the 12th chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. You'll remember that in the last couple of chapters, we've been looking at the Holy Spirit uh, using Paul as the Word of God. The Word is not yet complete, therefore we, we take the Scriptures as God's Word while keeping in mind that the Corinthians were looking at Paul. We have the testimony of the Holy Spirit that Paul had been called to complete the Word. We have the testimony of the Holy Spirit that Paul was a prototype of all who should hear and after believe unto eternal life. And so I've asked you folks not to look at Paul as some super saint or as some great hero of the faith, but rather the tool used by the Holy Spirit here as he uses the Word of God in our lives. I believe it's imperative that we continue that consideration as we go into the 13th chapter. Verse 1. The 13th chapter of, of 2 Corinthians has been a very, very difficult passage for most Bible teachers. I'm not suggesting that we'll solve any age-old problems here. But I want to continue in the same vein we've, we've used in previous studies, looking at Paul used by the Holy Spirit as the Word of God to the believers at Corinth. I cannot emphasize that enough. This is the third time I am coming to you. And as I pointed out in the 12th chapter, uh, so in the 13th, I believe the Scriptures are clearly declaring that Paul had been there twice before and that when he comes this time, it will be the third time. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Wow, that just seems a very, very difficult verse to put in context. Why is it phrased that way? Why does there appear to be such a departure from the theme of the last few studies together. And I'm going to suggest to you that I don't think there is. The argument, I think, since the days of St. Augustine have been that the reason for the last half of that verse is that Paul is declaring that in two or three visits he's fulfilled the requirement of the law, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established, and that his visits constitute the witnesses of the law. This is a, a quote, of course, from the book of Deuteronomy. Well, I'm going to suggest to you, all, for, first of all, that that seems contrary to the theme of God's Word in Deuteronomy. It's not that the same witness would testify three different times but rather that we would have two or three different witnesses whose stories would corroborate each other. And so it seems unlikely, at least to me, that the Holy Spirit is suggesting here that Paul's three witnesses by the same individual represent a fulfilling of the requirement of the law in the Old Testament. Others have argued, well, of course, that's true, but what Paul means here is that he and Timothy and Barnabas and, uh, or, or Silas or whoever else might have been part of his company constitute the two or three witnesses. 
Now, any one of those, of course, may be true. That may be the fact. I don't, I don't have sanctified immunity from error. Okay, We're studying this book together. I'm going to suggest to you that the Holy Spirit is saying, this is the third time that Paul's going to be at Corinth. What does that mean? That God is interested in the Corinthians. Apparently, as we read 1st and 2nd Corinthians, comparing it with the rest of the epistles, Corinth would have been a good group of believers to write off. You know, that's a, those, those folks, they're, they're a poor investment. They're a carnal group of believers in a very carnal environment. Let's concentrate our energy someplace else where that people are really interested in the Scriptures, you know, where they're really interested in the Lord. And somehow or other, we use those techniques today. You know, we look at the particular techniques that a missionary uses or a minister uses, you know, and if they result in growth that we can see, then we try to copy those techniques. You know, we try to get an expression of interest. And if we don't get anybody right in on this particular time slot or this particular radio station or, or interview on YouTube or whatever, then we cancel that program because we don't have any expression of interest. You know, it would, appear, uh, it would appear that if we had used those same techniques back in Paul's day, we would have written off these brothers and sisters at Corinth. And folks, if we could just somehow get Paul out of our mind as this, the great hero, and rather look at this as God Almighty, we find that He is supremely interested in His saints. And though they, in fact, may be a very carnal group of believers, God is supremely interested in them. There aren't too many of the various fellowship of believers in that day that could lay claim to three visits of Paul. And so I see in the first part of the verse a great, a grand expression of God's love and God's concern and God's interest in those who are His. Even though they may be very, very carnal and may be walking far, far from an, an intimate communion with the Lord, yet God is supremely interested in them. In the second part of the verse, I see God declaring that He's going to deal in fact, not in gossip, not in fiction, not or rumor, uh, but in fact. Not some great claim of Paul coming to exercise some supreme authority that he has as one of Christ's apostles. I am reading a simple statement by the Holy Spirit that when God deals in our lives, He deals in fact. And sometimes we don't like the fact that God deals with fact. You know, rationalizing, dreaming about certain things until, until they become correct in our own thinking, you know, in our own minds, ideas that we decide are the righteous will of God, even though they may in fact be contrary to the expressed will of God as revealed in this book. You know, we've, we've dreamed about them, rationalized them, until we've essentially made them true in our own logic and in our own experience, our own thinking. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying here that the Word of God is not partial, that it deals directly with that which is factual, that which is true. Verse, verse 2, I told you before, and in fact, I tell you now, as if I were there the second time, or, or we might translate that as when I was there the second time. And now being absent, I write to you, or at least to them who have sinned before, and to any of the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare, my Bible says. The idea uh, in the Greek is our word for ration. We're going to you know, ration gasoline or ration food, or because we have a shortage of something, 
The word means to ration or to refrain or to hold back. And in dealing with individuals, uh, it's often translated in classical Greek, to spare. But if I come, I will not refrain. I will not hold back. Not only is that a statement of Paul the Apostle, but I believe that's a statement of God, the Holy Spirit, that that's the way His Word works. If we really come to the Word, it will not hold back. Now, we may, we may, but it won't. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It deals with the facts of God, not the rationalized facts of our own desires, but God's truth. Verse 3, Since you are obviously seeking some proof of Christ speaking in me, and it seems to me that that is in harmony with the assumptions that we've made in the study of 2 Corinthians, that Paul represents to the Corinthians what the Word of God represents to you and, and to I today, you and to me, you and me, you and I, however you say that, today. Since you are seeking a proof, a proof. You know, you can recognize the problem of the Corinthians. They, they had many, an individual who professed to be speaking for God. Even the Jewish priest did that. Surely there were the voices of Roman mythology and, and Greek mythology who professed to be voices or oracles of God, maybe of more than one God. Why should they choose what Paul the Apostle says over what anyone else was saying? What do we as Christians involve ourselves in today more than anything? Trying to decide who to listen to. Dearly beloved, in the case of the Corinthians, they needed to listen to Paul simply because Paul represented the Word of God. The Word was not yet complete. You know, it wasn't a, a toss-up of philosophical ideas that, that the Corinthians needed to choose to follow, but the teaching of Paul that in, in essence became the written Word. It's no different than, than today, folks. You people also are exposed to an avalanche of doctrinal teaching, so-called. You also have the same problem, the identical problem that the Corinthians had. You have many voices to listen to. You have many authorities that at least claim to be authorities, much of it in written literature. I mean, books are just falling off the shelf. And so you are faced with the same problem, a problem of apologetics, as it's called today, you know, of establishing beyond reasonable doubt that the course that you've chosen and the authorities that you've chosen to follow are in fact the right ones. In fact, I think that, that one of the major reasons for, for Bema, our accounting before God, which is soon to be around the corner, I believe, is to establish the reason behind the authorities that you chose to follow. I've taken essentially a negative position against apologetics in many of our studies. I, 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 I understand that, but you've got to be fair that I've always taken that position in using apologetics to argue with the unbeliever. I find nothing wrong whatsoever with a Christian putting the Word of God to the test. You know, it would seem to me, in fact, that my God enjoys that and encourages that. It's, it's the believer who never puts the Word of God to the test, who, who never is willing to look at it with an eye of scrutiny to establish its documentation, its authority, its, its inspiration. You know, the Christian who has no interest in the things of God, I see nothing wrong with the Corinthians seeking some proof that Christ is speaking through Paul. If Christ, in fact, is not speaking through Paul, then it would be foolish to listen to what Paul has to say. But I think you and I need to see here that the Holy Spirit is emphasizing that what Paul is saying to Corinth is what God is saying to Corinth. And that in that 
equation, Paul becomes nothing. And then we have, we've been studying together here the words of God Almighty to the believers at Corinth, which has an application to the believers that blessed hope forever. Since you seek such a proof of Christ speaking in me, who towards you is not weak, but is mighty in you, that is, Christ is not weak towards you, but is mighty in you. If you remember back in chapter 12, verse 11, we read, For I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. I think the argument of the 13th chapter is that finally we have to come back to the witness of the Scriptures. We've had two chapters of apologetics, so to speak, a verification, a documentation of Paul's apostleship. And I've simply extended that to say that that's the way God defends His Word. But those external evidences apparently haven't worked with the believers at Corinth. I think that the 11th verse of the 12th chapter says they should have. You know, if you had properly looked at the evidence, you should have recognized me as a proper apostle of Christ. But by the time we get to the 13th chapter, we see they're still seeking a proof. Verse 4. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. You could say that that weakness was his incarnation. I believe that that weakness was flesh, not his incarnation, but it, the weakness of the law because of the flesh. Romans chapter 4, for what the law could not do in that it was weak by means of the flesh. That's the weakness here. Not the weakness of Christ's incarnation. He was incarnated in human flesh in order that He might fulfill the law. And the weakness that's spoken of here is the inability, the absolute no strength of the law to do what God did by grace through Christ. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteousness of God might be revealed in us. It's that weakness that I believe is the subject of, of verse 4. The weakness of the law through the flesh. What it could not do, God did, and God did it by sending His own Son. Now, if you see in the word sending, only the fact that, well, Christ came down from heaven, you've missed the entire point of the Scriptures. When God, our Father, sent Christ, He sent Him incarnate in human flesh, number one, that He might be our kinsman, and number two, that he might meet the, the claims of the law. Now the law was weak by means of the flesh, and in that weakness, Christ was crucified, yet he lives by the power of God. It's by God's power that an accounting transaction was made so that your transgression and mine was placed upon Jesus Christ and his righteousness credited to our account. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. So He liveth by the power of God. We also are weak in Him, but we shall live with Him by the power of God toward you. I think the, the statement of verses 3 and 4 is an introduction to an internal personal examination rather than, than to an external examination of evidence. To say that that Jesus Christ was crucified through weakness and lives by power uh, means one thing to the person who knows nothing of, of regeneration, and it means something totally different 
to the one who is. And so the, the fifth verse becomes the text of a thousand evangelistic sermons. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. You know, one of the old classic verses of the authorized version used by evangelists worldwide to try to get people to come to Christ that they might be redeemed. The subject of the chapter is to redeem people. Except we got just one slight problem, folks. These people are already redeemed. Test yourselves, examine yourself. Test would be a, a better word. Put yourself to the test since you are in the faith. Wow, what a difference. Put yourself to the test since you are in the faith. This is not addressed to unredeemed people who might be headed for hell. This is not an evangelistic appeal, some appeal to get you to come and accept Christ. This is an imperative command to those of you who are in Christ Jesus to put yourself to the test since you're in the faith and prove yourself. This, the word is dokamazo, the word for proving. It's never used for testing something to see if it's bad but testing something to, to show that it's good. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates. Know ye not yourselves how Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you are a counterfeit. Folks, we already have the statement of the Holy Spirit in earlier chapters, that Satan arrays himself as messengers of light, uh, his messengers as messengers of light, his messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there are many in the body of believers who are tear, sowed by Satan, not members of the family in the household of God. The message here, dearly beloved, is not addressed to non-believers. To those who are in God's family, it, it's addressed. Those who are in the faith put themselves to the test. Unless, of course, you're a counterfeit, then none of this is going to work. You're not going to even hear, much less believe or be able to test anything. Remember 4.4, In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Chapter 4, verse 4. So the message is to those who are in Christ, you who are in Christ, put yourself to the test. Well, how do I put myself to the test, Steve? You know, since I'm in the faith. Is that to say that I'm to find out whether or not I'm redeemed? Is that to be a self-examination to see whether or not I am truly a Christian? No. Sorry, folks. The language doesn't say that. The language says, put yourself to the test since you're in the faith. It is a first-class condition. It's one that assumes the reality of that condition. So the testing is not whether or not I'm redeemed, the testing must be something else. <clears throat> we are to contend earnestly for the faith. It's articulated. The faith. It's talking about our walk, not our redemption. First of all, I want you to see in the fifth verse an expression of comfort. Now that may seem like, like an odd thing to say, but the first thing is God is not questioning their redemption. That's the kind of thing that we do, okay? God doesn't do that. We do that. If someone lives in open sin, if someone commits those things which we think are contrary to Christian ethics, so-called, then the first conclusion we jump to or the first thought that seems to pass through our noggin is that they're not redeemed. 
The guy's a fake. The first thing I see in the fifth verse is that God is comforting these believers at Corinth. If you turn back with me to the beginning of the epistle, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we also may be able to comfort them who are in any trouble. And now I end the book, almost, verse 5, 13.5, examine yourself since you're in the faith. Dearly beloved, I hear that verse say, God Almighty says, Dearly beloved, I'm not questioning your redemption because that was done in Christ. That's why verses 3 and 4 are there. What Christ has done is assured your redemption. That's not the question. Therefore, the putting myself to the test is not to determine whether or not I'm going to make it to heaven whether or not I'm redeemed, whether or not I'm in the body of Christ. Rather, the putting myself to the test is more like Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is the only reasonable thing that you can do because of what Christ has done. Remember that the 12th chapter ended with the, the inappropriateness of those who are redeemed in the Lord Jesus Christ, living in sin and being unrepentant. And so I see not only the concern of God in comforting the believers that their redemption is assured in Christ, but I see God's concern for us in our walk so that we rejoice, so that our trusting hearts swell with gratitude and thanksgiving to our Heavenly Father, that by grace we are redeemed and not by works, that it's not for any merit in us that God called us to Himself, but because of His infinite love and grace through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But to the callous mind, that could become a credit card to sin. That could... That could lead to a nonchalant or, or callous attitude on the part of the, of the believer towards sin. It often does. I don't believe, dearly beloved, the question has ever been from 1 Corinthians 1 to the end of 2 Corinthians, never has the question been their redemption. Never, ever has the Holy Spirit tried to in any way cause any doubt in the minds of these Corinthians that they might, in fact, not be a Christian. And I believe that's one of the great expressions of comfort that's characteristic of the grace of our God. However, it seems to me that we've missed a tremendous message in these two epistles if we don't recognize that God, who is concerned enough to redeem us to buy us at the price of the death of His Son is also concerned about our walk, walking worthy of our calling. Now, it's a very difficult thing in Bible study to walk that fine line, to make that careful differentiation between falling headlong into a merit-based system or attitude, looking carefully at the way we walk with with Christ, there's an area of fellowship and communion that is very, very important to our God. I am in no way attempting to minimize the reality, the, the vitality, the urgency of a faithful walk with Christ when I proclaim God's sovereignty and God's grace. They are not two doctrinal considerations and they are not two separate entities by themselves. One must be careful, extremely careful not to fall into the, the catch-all that has plagued the steps of Christianity for 2,000 years by looking at the walk and making that walk a contingency of redemption. 
I believe, I wholeheartedly believe the Holy Spirit has done a marvelous job in these epistles that not once has any Corinthian believer had any doubt cast on his relationship to God. Not once. Not once has there been any undermining of the peace that he has with God. Not once has there been any undermining of the love of God. In the fifth verse, the, the English translation would indicate that there is a possibility that they may not be in the faith, but I believe the language is set in reality. The indicative mood is the mood of certainty. I want you to put yourself to the test since you're in the faith. Are you really committed to Christ? Are you really walking with Christ? Or are you in the last verse of chapter 11 among those who have not repented or changed their mind about their manner of, of walk, their manner of life, even though they be God's children? Dearly beloved, He's dealing with us, His children. Surely God's concern is that I be redeemed, but God totally handled that concern. I've asked you in study after study after study that if we, could, if, we just, if we could just get away from that, if we could get away from that, if we could get away from the attitude or the thought that our redemption is in peril so that we could concentrate with clearer vision on the person and the work of Christ, the, the quality and the reality of our walk by faith, no matter how you stumble and fall in your walk, you will not jeopardize your redemption. These things are called positional and experiential. There are all kinds of techniques used to try to separate them. I, I want to be as careful as I can, folks, but I, I not only see an expression of comfort because of the certainty of your redemption, but I see an expression of concern about the quality of your walk. We are called to walk in the same grace that redeemed us. It seems to me that verse 5 in the context is saying that you Corinthians, you have all along been looking for some extra proof of your position in Christ, whether it's signs, miracles, whatever. And it seems to me that that's very parallel to where many Christians today spend their entire lives trying to generate some external proof or looking back to some external proof that they're in the faith. We should not, not be looking to external evidences. Rather, examine yourself. And when you do that, you will find that you are in the faith once delivered to the saints the righteousness that is based on faith. I think you're seeing in the fifth verse an emphasis on an internal or, or introspective examination that leads to a certainty of what God has done for you in Christ. I am absolutely positive there's frustration in continually trying to find confidence of, of one's position in Christ based on something outside of himself, something external or in feelings, or ideas, and different philosophies. And, and I believe theological error precedes moral error, and vice versa. If you'll look inside yourself, you'll find the witness of the Spirit. That's the confirmation. The examine to me in verse 5 did not, could not be used to examine whether or not I'm redeemed, but rather whether or not I'm walking like I should. Walking like a redeemed person walks. I see the fifth verse saying, put yourself to the test since you're in the faith. The question not being whether or not you're in the faith, but the question being whether or not as in the faith, you're living like one in the faith should. I love you all. I truly do. We are living in exciting times. Perilous times. 
confusing times. We are watching unfold before our eyes at the very present time what could be some real signs of our Lord's near return. I ask God's blessing and peace upon each one of you. Rest in Him because He loves you with an everlasting love. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.